الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala And may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam As to what follows my dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Walhamdulillah, indeed it is a tremendous blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he allows us to gather in one of his houses. And these are the most beloved places on earth to Allah azza wa jal. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he accept our gathering and he forgive our sins and our shortcomings. My brothers and sisters in Islam, tonight's lecture is titled sins and desires and evil temptations and it is a fact that the greatest illness and sickness and disease upon mankind today are sins and evil desires and temptations this is the greatest sickness on earth today upon mankind and this is far worse than any physical sickness and disease. You know, a physical sickness, when someone is struck with a physical sickness, it is a source of purification and elevation. And when a person dies, the pains of the physical sickness is gone. So there actually is no evil in physical sickness. <coughs> You cleanse yourself from the sins. It's a source of purification and a person is elevated in the rank of Allah Azza wa Jal when he's patient upon the physical sickness. And when you die, it's all over. But the spiritual sickness and the spiritual disease, which is sins and evil desires, they are a source of degradation and humiliation. And they are a source of destruction in this life and in the grieve and in the afterlife. That's why spiritual sickness, which is sins and disease, sins and desires are far worse than physical sicknesses. And we have until the end of our life. For some of us, this could be tomorrow. For some, it could be next week. For some, it could be next year, Allahu Alam. But we have from now until the end of our lives to work on purifying our heart from sins and desires. It is a battle between you and a shaitan and between you and your nafs. And we're fighting this battle every single day, every moment of the day, and every moment of the night. And this day and age that we're in, this fight only gets more difficult and more challenging. And if a person is far away from Islamic knowledge, far away from al-masjid, and he's far away from good company, then he has a great challenge ahead of him. Allahu alam. How is he going to defeat sins and desires in his life? How is he going to find protection? Allahu alam. The fight is going to be huge. With shaitan and his nafs perhaps could defeat him. And he will fall a victim to sins and desires and perhaps that's how he will die. You have to, especially in this day and age, you must be close to al-masjid. You must be consistently listening to lectures. Lectures that remind you of Allah Azza wa Jal and bring you closer to Allah. You must be inside al-masjid offering your salawat at least once a day or a few times a week. And you must be upon or among righteous company. If you're doing these three things, you have a good chance bi'ithnillah to stand up against or to stand ground when challenging and battling sins and desires. You'll have a chance bi'ithnillah. And my brothers and sisters in Islam, Allah Azza wa Jal, He said, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ On the day of judgment, 
no amount of wealth and no children will be of benefit to anyone. Nothing, zero. Except man atallaha bi qalbin salim, except for the one who came on the day of judgment with a pure heart, a heart that has been purified from sin and disease, from sin and desires. Hence why it's important to speak about this matter from time to time. And for you and I to be reminded about sins and evil desires. The only thing that will benefit you on the day of judgment when standing before Allah Azzawajal, is to have a pure heart, a heart that has been cleansed from shirk in all its forms, major and minor, from sins in all its forms, major and minor, and from innovations. This is what Al Qalbu Salim is the pure heart. And you have, as I said to you, from now until you die, to work on purifying the heart. And it's possible. And the lecture, bi'ithnillahi ta'ala, tonight I will share with you tools in how a person could fight sins and desires from his life. Steps towards how can a person avoid desires and evil temptations. And if a person is happy, and he's content to be in this state and condition of sin and evil desires. And he's given up on a tawbah. He's given up on repentance. He makes no effort in turning to Allah Azza wa Jal through repentance. If that's the state of a person, then he is headed towards the hellfire. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to save us. Anytime you hear the word, the hellfire, you say, may Allah Azza wa Jal save us. You say, na'udhu billahi min ghada billahi wa min narihi. My brothers and sisters in Islam, Anna, I want, to, I want to make sure that you understand the importance of keeping away from sins and evil desires. Why is it important to make every effort in your life to keep away from them? I want you to understand how virtuous it is for a believer to keep away from sins and evil desires. Wallahi, do not understand and don't think that keeping away from a sin, yani I lost a moment of joy and pleasure and temptation. If I keep away from a sin, I gained nothing. Don't ever think like this. Al-ulama rahimahumullah, they mentioned that keeping away from prohibitions, keeping away from sins is better than engaging in many voluntary actions. And I give you an example. Let's say there is a person who spent the entire night fighting himself against a sin. Every time he's tempted, he keeps away. And he fights his nafs, he fights his desire, and he spends the whole night like this. And let's say that same person spent the night praying voluntary salat qiyamul layl. For that person to fight his nafs against the sin the whole night, that is more virtuous and more rewarding than spending an entire night praying Salatul Layl. You know why? Because keeping away from a sin is an obligation. It is wajib to keep away from a sin. And to pray the entire night in a voluntary Salat, it's only voluntary. It's not wajib. And the wajib takes precedence over that which is recommended. Therefore, if you spent an entire night fighting your nafs to keep away from a sin, not to fall into it, that is much more rewarding and much more virtuous than to pray an entire night of Salatul Layl. Allahu Akbar. I'm sharing this with you so you can understand that avoiding a sin is virtuous. It's huge in the sight of Allah and there's immense reward in this. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Did you hear that? 
The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, avoid the sins, avoid the evil desires and temptations, and you will be the most righteous among mankind. Look at the virtue. You know why? Because a'malul bir, righteous deeds, could be done by anyone. Everyone prays. Everyone can pick up a Quran and sit down and read. Many people engage in charity work, right? People give donations, people feed the poor, the needy, people contribute to building al masajid and orphanages and so on. Very easy. Everyone can do righteous deeds. But only the righteous believer is the one who keeps away from sins. Only the righteous believer keeps away from sins. Not everyone can do that. And this is why the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, avoid the sins and you from among all of mankind will be the most upright, the most righteous. Allahu Akbar. Well, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah, he said, مَا عَبَدَ الْعَابِدُونَ بِشَيْءٍ أَفْضَلَ بِتَرْكِهِمْ مَا نَهَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُ He said the best thing a worshiper can do concerning his servitude to Allah is to avoid what Allah prohibited. Did you hear that? He said the best thing a believer can do is to keep away from that which Allah prohibited. Because that's where the test in life is. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, he said, avoiding the sin of oppression is much better than 500 voluntary hajj. Imagine hajj, 500 hajj. How much is this going to cost? How much effort is it going to take? Look, enter in your life, you'll never do 500 hajj. That needs 500 years. He's telling you avoiding a sin is better than 500 voluntary hajj. Why? Once again, because avoiding a sin is wajib, obligatory. And 500 voluntary hajj is mustahab. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, from among the seven categories that are shaded in the shade of Allah azza wa jal on the day of judgment, he said, wa rajulun, a man who was called by a woman that was beautiful and she had a high position in society. A woman of high status in society, meaning she can get away with her crime. Because the higher you are in society, the less accountable you become. Right? That's why the majority of politicians are corrupt. Because right up the top, who's going to hold them to account? So imagine a woman that has high position in society. And she's a beautiful looking woman. And she's the one who came to you and said to you, I am prepared to do a zina. And you said, Inni Allah. I fear Allah. I cannot do this. And you run away and you walk away. Such a person is under the shade of Allah on the day of judgment. Yani Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us avoiding a sin, avoiding a desire, avoiding an evil temptation is a reason for why a person is shaded on the day of judgment when there is no shade except that shade and people are running wild and loose. يَقُولُ الْإِنسَانُ يَوْمَ إِذٍ أَيْنَ الْمَفَرْ The human being is running and saying, where is refuge? Where can I run? Where can I protect myself? إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ يَوْمَ إِذٍ الْمُسْتَقَرْ There's nowhere to hide. That's the moment in which the human being regrets every sin he fell into. يَوْمَ إِذٍ يَتَذَكَّرُ الْإِنسَانُ وَأَنَّا لَهُ الذِّكْرَىٰ Allah he says on that day, the human being will remember. يتذكر. You see this, يتذكر. It, em it emphasizes the verb. يعني the human being remembers every sin he fell into, every adult content he consumed with his eyes, every zina he committed with his hands, 
Every zina he committed with his tongue. Every zina he committed with his feet. Every haram he engaged in, he'll regret, he'll remember. Allah says, لَهُ الذِّكْرَ How is remembering these matters and regretting them now is going to be of benefit to you? So avoiding a sin, avoiding an evil desire, it's worth all your energy. It's worth all your effort. So that on the day of judgment, when you are resurrected, you are standing underneath the shade of Allah. So I'm telling you once again, avoiding a sin is virtuous. Don't think that avoiding a sin, I lost out on a moment of pleasure and temptation I could have had. The moment of joy and pleasure you would have is short-lived. What are you going to enjoy with a sin? What? A minute? Five minutes? An hour? And then it's going to have a long regret and a long suffering of pain and anguish. Umar ibn Abd al-Aziz, rahimahullah, he said, ليست التقوى صيام النهار وقيام الليل التقوى أداء ما افترض الله وترك ما نهى الله عنه عمر بن عبد العزيز who's titled as the fifth khalifa and he comes from the lineage of Umar رضي الله عنه listen to his deep understanding of what التقوى is you know we all hear the word التقوى he said that taqwa is not praying the days and fast, fasting the days and praying the nights. He means voluntary, the voluntary matters. He said that's not what a taqwa really is. Of course, it is part of a taqwa, but it's not the peak and the essence of a taqwa. He said the absolute peak and essence and foundation of a taqwa is to do what Allah obligated and to keep away from that which Allah prohibited. You know what that means? Meaning every time you keep away from a sin, you are engaging in the act of a taqwa. That's what taqwa is. Practically, this is what a taqwa is. Up until this day, I have young boys that ask me during lessons, what is a taqwa? What's the meaning of a taqwa? What's the deep definition of a taqwa? You forget about the meaning. Come, I'll teach you the practical implementation of a taqwa. When you're tempted to do al haram, when haram today is easily accessible on these devices, and within the devices, apps of social media and what have you, easily accessed. Unlike before, a taqwa, my brother and my sister, is when you avoid, when you battle yourself, I don't want to do this. And you keep the haram away from you. You have a business offer that is offering you money through al-haram. You're tempted. That's a huge figure. That's a huge sum. But you know what? I don't want it. Because the money that's coming through this job is haram money because the job is haram. And you fight yourself and you keep away. My brother, and my sister, this in itself is taqwa. That, that, that there is a practical implementation of a taqwa. That's what you should know. So this is what a taqwa is. Avoiding sins and doing that which Allah Azza wa Jal obligated. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he mentions to us a few matters that practically help us in avoiding sins. From them, number one, listen to these very carefully. I'm going to give you tools, practical tools, that the more you have of them in your life, the more you are protected against sins. And the less you have of them, the less protection you have against sins and evil desires. As I mention them to you, one after the other, you sit down and think, how much have you implemented this tool in your life? If it doesn't exist in your life, note it down and work towards it. If it exists, alhamdulillah, 
work on strengthening it. Because the more you have of these, bi'ithnillah, the more protection you have against sins and evil desires. Number one, the first matter you need to know about sins and evil desires is that sins by nature are repulsive, abhorrent, despicable, disgusting, dirty, and filthy. This is the first thing you need to know about sins. Allah Azza wa Jal only forbid matters because they are disgusting and filthy. When you are aware of this, then this is a reason for why a person will keep away from a sin. I'll give you an example. You see, the normal human being, the normal human being, whose fitrah, natural disposition, has not been distorted and corrupted, he runs away from anything that is filthy and disgusting. And he, if you now smelt a bad smell, and it smelt disgusting, what would you do? You turn your head and run the other way? Because naturally the human being doesn't like a disgusting smell. If you ate something really bad, naturally you'll spit it out and you'll never taste that food ever again. And you'll wash your mouth. Right? And even it'll be expressed, you can express it on your face that you are disgusted by that which you ate. If you see something disgusting, let's say you walked into a public toilet and you saw najasa all around the toilet, the toilet wasn't flushed. You're disgusted. You run out of this bathroom and you go. Even if you have to hold yourself until you get home. Why? Why would you do this? Because naturally the human being is turned off from disgusting sights and disgusting smells and disgusting tastes and so on. And naturally the human being, he comes close to that which is good and pleasant. If I smelt a good smell and a scent and a perfume on you, I smell it again. I ask you, brother, where did you get this smell from? What's its name? I put its name down. I want to purchase it. When it ends and finishes, I buy a new one. This natural human being whose filter hasn't been changed loves that which is good. You eat something that's nice. You enjoy it. You speak about it. You tell others, well, you should go to such and such restaurant. It has the best food. Naturally, human beings are like this. So we keep away from that which is dirty and we come close to that which is pure and good. So the important principle here for you to know is that everything that Allah forbid, everything that is haram, every sin and every evil desire, it is harmful. It is disgusting. It damages and destroys us. It damages our heart. It damages our bodies. It damages our soul. It ruins our iman. It ruins our afterlife. It destroys our relationship with Allah. There's nothing good in sins. I give you examples. Look at alcohol. How many times do we hear from time to time on the news and new research that says no alcohol is good for a human being? Then a few months later, a recent study has shown that one cup of alcohol is good for human beings. Then a few years later, another research comes. Actually, zero alcohol is good for a human being's health. These people are confused because they don't have wahi. They don't have guidance. So every time they do a research, sometimes alcohol is good, sometimes it's not, sometimes it's bad. Amma al-Muslim, alhamdulillah, we ask Allah Azza wa to preserve our iman. With our eyes closed, we know that alcohol is all filthy. And it's all of it is no good. Why? Because Allah made it haram. And if Allah has made something haram, meaning what? Meaning it's disgusting, abhorrent, filthy, dirty. Khalas. And a human being, a natural human being, keeps away from that which is filthy. You look at drugs. The harms are apparent. Everyone knows the harm of drugs. It intoxicates. It leads to murder. It leads to crimes. There. Everything that Allah made haram is full of harms and filth. And the natural, normal human being keeps away from that which is filthy and harmful. 
Look at pork, the same story. Look at arriba. Arriba, interest. It's oppression. Look at the recent years in which the interest rate is rising all across the globe. What has it done to the mental health of people? See, arriba is haram because it's harmful. When the believer knows that Allah Azza wa Jal is looking at him and Allah is a raqib he is watchful over him and sees him and hears him then the believer will be too shy from his Lord to expose himself to the anger and the punishment of Allah Al-Haya shyness from Allah Al-Haya it comes from the word Hayat and Hayat means life the one who has shyness of Allah in his heart is a person who is alive. And the one who doesn't have shyness of Allah, the one who walks around and he's ignorant of the fact that Allah can see him, maybe his body is alive but his heart is dead. Shyness of Allah brings life to the heart. Today, no one will dare to commit a sin in front of his father or in front of his mother or in front of his sister or in front of her brother or in front of his wife or in front of her husband not even in front of young children you wouldn't dare you're too shy no way a desire will not even come to your mind that neck you're shy how can you commit a sin in front of your father impossible I won't do it. But you know, the reality is, your father and your mother and all these people we mentioned, they were Azza wa Jal. Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who will judge you. He's the one who sees you and he's the one who will judge you. Therefore, Allah deserved that you be shy of him more than anyone else. Because he's the one who will judge. You see, today, if a person was in a room alone and he was indulging in something that is haram and he hears the squeaking of the door, he will immediately drop the haram only to realize that it was the wind that pushed the door. Only to realize that it was Allah Azzawajal who continued to grant him life as he was committing the sin. Isn't such a person, isn't such a person ashamed of himself that he was terrified of a breeze that pushed the door and he wasn't shy of Allah Azza wa Jal that saw him at the moment he is committing his sin, that continued to give permission for the blood in his veins to flow and for his lungs to continue to breathe. Isn't he shy of his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala? That he continued to allow the blood to flow in your eyes. If Allah Azza wa Jal wanted, he could have caused the blood clot in your eye. And then the sight will be gone, blinded, couldn't see anymore. And consider that these are blessings that Allah gave you. And as believers, we're supposed to be grateful to the favors of Allah. And in order to be grateful to a favor of Allah, you're not supposed to use it in a sin and disobedience. And I give you something extremely practical in this point of al hayau min Allah, being shy of Allah. You see, whenever you approach to commit a sin, no matter what the sin is, right? Sins are plenty. I tell you something, every single time the believer is tempted to commit a sin, deep down in his heart and in his mind, there is a noise that is saying to him, Allah is watching. No doubt, right? Because if you didn't have this voice in your head, and you did not believe that Allah is watching, a person is a kafir. You will always have this, it's somewhere there in the head. That the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam called it, Wa'idhu Allahi fi qalbi kulli mu'min. 
It is the advisor of Allah in the heart of every believer. So when you approach to commit a sin, 100%, there is a feeling within you that is telling you Allah is watching. At that moment, we ask Allah Azza wa to save us from sins. But very practical advice. At the moment of committing a sin, don't suppress that feeling. Bring that feeling to your life and bring it onto your tongue. Say, say, Allah is watching. Say, Ma'adh Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal says, Alam ya'lam bi anna Allah yara? Doesn't the person know that Allah is watching? Say yes. Yes, oh Allah, I know you are watching. Say it aloud, say it aloud. Say it aloud. Look, Yusuf alayhi salam, when he was in the setting, he was in a room, and the wife of Al-Aziz, the wife of the king was in the room. And she had adorned and prepared herself. And above this, she said to him, Hey Talak, I'm prepared for you. Come towards me. She wanted to commit a zina. This is a moment of haram, right? This is a moment of pleasure and temptation. Think of it like a moment between you and your phone. And a person is tempted to do al haram. You know what Yusuf alayhi salam said? At that very moment, he said, Qala ma'adh Allah. He said, I seek refuge in Allah. I seek the protection of Allah. He said the word Allah. When you are about to commit a sin, say, Ma'adh Allah. Say, A'udhu Billah. Say, I know Allah is watching. Speak aloud. Don't suppress the feeling. Because if you suppress it, it'll die. Which shaytan will get the better of you. Understand at that moment you are in a battle with your nafs and a shaytan. And what's the greatest weapon against the shaytan? Dhikrullah. Dhikrullah. This is why in Al-Hajj, the final days of Al-Hajj, we stone, right? We do a rajam. We stone. Some people think that the stone and the size of the stone is what will make him defeat the shaytan. So you'll see some funny clips go around. People throwing shoes in there, people throwing rocks in there. But the idea is, you know what actually allows you to defeat a shaitan? It's the Allahu Akbar with every stone you stone. It's the takbir that you make before you throw your pebble. Even dhikrullah is what will give you this victory against a shaitan. So in a moment and in a setting in where there is a sin and an evil desire in front of you, Say, Ma'adh Allah. When Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Wala yathqulu ma'asmillahi shay. Nothing can outweigh the name of Allah. Say, so if there was a scale, and your dhikr of Allah is on one side of the scale, and your temptation is on the other side of the scale, dhikr Allah would outweigh your temptation, and your temptation will die. The second thing you do, once you're in that setting and you begin to say Ma'adh Allah, do what Yusuf alayhi salam did. What did he do after he said Ma'adh Allah? He ran to the door. He then get up from where the setting of the sin is and run away from there. Move away because that's a position in where the shaitan came to you. Move. And you know, when Yusuf alayhi salam walked and he got to the door, وَأَلْفَيَا سَيِّدَهَا لَدَ الْبَابِ Her husband was on the door standing. He opened the door. You know what that means? That means relief. خلاص. Relief came to Yusuf alayhi salam. Between you saying, أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ and moving away from where you are going to commit the sin, between that moment and relief is only a matter of seconds. Only a matter of its meters. And then the temptation and the evil desire that you sensed within your heart has been turned off. خلاص, finished. That's a practical way of how you fight a sin. And don't ever believe that if you did this and you walked away, that you walked away empty-handed. I said to you, this is how you practice taqwa and iman. 
And in addition, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, وَمَنْ هَمَّ بِسَيِّئَةٍ فَلَمْ يَعْمَلْهَا كُتِبَتْ لَهُ حَسَنَةٌ كَامِلَةٌ Anyone who was concerned and tempted to do a sin, but he left it and he walked away from it because he was shy of Allah. He knew that Allah was watching. You know what the result is? Allah would record for him a complete hasana. A hasana he didn't do. But because he fought his nafs against the sin and the desire. And this process repeated every time you're tempted by a sin. Today, unfortunately, many of the youth, many of our brothers and sisters have given up on the process of a tawbah and hope in Allah. He says, I've been battling my sins and desires for many years to no avail. I haven't benefited. I keep doing tawbah, istighfar, usalah, tawbah, it's so working. What else do I do? I keep falling in the same sin. Whether it's a drug I'm consuming, whether it's a girlfriend I'm meeting, whether it's a boyfriend I'm meeting, whether it's texting the opposite gender with haram words, whether it's adult content consumed on the phones and social media, whether it's haram money he's engaged in, whatever the case, whether it's a cigarette he's smoking, whatever the case, never, ever, ever give up in your return to Allah and in your tawbah. Wallahi, my brothers and sisters in Islam. For you to die a mujahid, a fighter against your own sins and desires, is better for you than dying having given up from a tawbah and forgiveness. At least on the day of judgment, you'll be resurrected. You will meet Allah, a mujahid, a fighter against your evil sins and desires and temptations. Isn't that better to meet Allah? Having always fought, you fell in a sin, you got up, you made a tawbah with stighfar, and you followed up your sin with good deeds, with a sadaqah, with two rak'at, with istighfar, with reciting some Quran, with fasting the next day. Isn't that better than you meeting Allah جل, saying, Oh Allah, I've tried the tawbah many times, it didn't work, so I just gave up. And I accepted the life of sin into my lifestyle. Khalas, I just gave up. And I accepted and I embraced the fact that I am an addict. I am addicted to this sin. Khalas, the tawbah and seeking forgiveness doesn't work for me. I accepted this fact. Wallahi, you're setting yourself up for danger. If that's the mindset and the mentality you're approaching your sins with. Never give up. A companion came to Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Said to him, Ya Rasulullah, I commit a sin, then I repent. I commit a sin, then I repent. I commit a sin, then I repent. And he mentioned it four times. Then he said, Ya Rasulullah, until when? Yani until when is this cycle? He said to him, Hatta yakuna shaytan huwa al mahsur. Until you defeat the shaytan. Not until the shaytan defeats you. If you defeat the shaytan, that means you've broken out of the cycle of sin. Alhamdulillah. And if you gave up on a tawbah, and you said, brother, tawbah is not for me, man. I've tried it many times. It just doesn't work. Then a shaytan has defeated you. You're in a battle. You can't stop. Then don't stop. The repentance, simple. You can't stop your sin then don't stop the tawbah or istighfar. Just like you can't stop your sin, why would you stop on a tawbah or istighfar? Why? That's a trick from a shaitan. That's how a shaitan defeats you. So this is a matter you're supposed to understand. That's how you sit, that's how you defeat sin and evil desires in your life. Even, even if you're tempted and you just cannot find a way out. Keep seeking forgiveness. Don't give up. And don't ever think that it's to no avail. Don't think I'm just wasting my time. Khalas, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a munafiq. These are thoughts from a shaitan. They're not from Allah. 
they are not from Allah. I tell you what's from Allah. What's from Allah is what's in the Quran. And what's in the Quran is what Allah says, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ قُلْ The ayah started with قُلْ Meaning, O oh Messenger of Allah, announce publicly to mankind. Get up and announce and make the entire world hear this message of Allah. That's not a secret message. This is public. This is supposed to go viral to every single human being that is suffering and struggling with sins and desires. Go and tell them all. Ya ibadi, my slaves, Allahu Akbar. Allah Azza wa Jal ascribed us to Himself. That's an honor in and of itself for us that he calls us ibadi. He did not say, Ya sinners, Ya evil people, Ya dirty, filthy people. That's not how the ayah started. Ya ibadi, my slaves, Alladheena asrafu ala anfusihim, those who have transgressed against themselves. You know what asrafu means? Al israf. Al-Israf is a person who has committed every sin under the sun, hasn't left anything of them, and he has repeated them a million times until he became bored. And he has sinned on every inch of Allah's land. And his sins have reached the skies in their size and their amount. This is what Asrafu ala anfusihim means. That's the one who Allah is talking to. That's the one who he's addressing. He says to him, لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Do not give up in the mercy of Allah. Do not give up on the path of repentance. Do not give up in seeking his forgiveness after your sin. Do not give up. And if you give up, meaning you did not know who Allah is, you are ignorant of Allah. If you give up on seeking forgiveness, meaning you abate the shaitan over Allah, because it's the shaitan who told you, give up, you hypocrite. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله. Then Allah Azza wa Jal states a fact: إن الله يغفر الذنوب جميعا. Allah forgives all sins, even the major shirk. Nothing could get worse than that. But even that is included within the ayah. إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْغَفُورُ الرَّحِيمُ Indeed, He's the one who is all forgiving, all merciful. وَأَنِيبُوا إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ And turn to your Lord. Turn. You see, At-Tawbah, it comes from the word Taba. Taba means Raja'a. It means to return. The idea of At-Tawbah is that a person has become far away from Allah. So At-Tawbah is saying, come back to the path of Allah. Come back to the path of righteousness and Iman and Islam. That's the idea. This is how a person safeguards his Iman and his, and his Islam. And I give you good news, my brothers and sisters in Islam. People on the Day of Judgment are four types. A person that meets Allah with major shirk, having associated partners with Allah and worshipped idols. Allahu Akbar. Such a person is in Jahannam forever. We ask Allah Azza wa to save us. The most merciful, the most forgiving, the most forgiving will not have mercy upon such a person. He's finished. The second category of people are people that come on the day of judgment. They meet Allah Azza wa Jal with minor shirk. Minor shirk. Such as taking oath by other than Allah and putting the blue eye in his business and in his car, believing that this is a means of protection. These are all forms of minor shirk. 
If a person meets Allah on the day of judgment with minor shirk, then al ulama they have two opinions. One opinion mentions he has to go to the hellfire and he will burn for a while, then he will come out. Another opinion suggests that he is under the will of Allah. Perhaps Allah will punish him, perhaps he'll spare him punishment. The third type of person is a person who meets Allah, but he never committed any shirk, no minor, no major, but he fell into major sins and minor sins. And he died having not repented. Such a person is tahta al mashiah He is under the will of Allah. If Allah wants to forgive him and admit him into the paradise, we don't know, that's by Allah's permission. And if Allah punished him, then Allah decided to punish him. And the fourth category, and this bi idhnillah, we ask Allah to make us from this fourth category, is the person who meets Allah on the day of judgment, free from every shirk, major and minor. But he has major and minor sins in his life, but he died upon tawbah from them. This person does not see Jahannam. And such a person goes to the paradise and is not punished at all. You see how important a tawbah is in your life? What was the difference between the fourth person and the third person? Both of them committed sins, minor and major sins. And both of them freed and cleared themselves from shirk. But the third ignored and gave up on a tawbah when still fall. And the fourth understood that even if I am tested with sins, I will keep doing tawbah with still fall. If he died upon a tawbah with still fall, that he enters the paradise with no punishment. And there is no khilaf concerning this. So there is a chance for everyone. This is how you avoid sins. With this kind of belief in Allah Azza wa Jal. Sooner or later, Allah Azza wa Jal will aid you, will support you to overcome your desire, to overcome your sin. And if you die while still having the habit of this sin, then if you died upon a tawbah, inshallah your matters before Allah Azza wa Jal are good. But don't ever, ever normalize a sin in your life. And don't understand from that which I said, that it's normal khalas, that's a green card, and a license to continue to sin against Allah Azza wa Jal. Because that belief is a disease in and of itself. A person does his best to keep away from sins in all of their forms. And the ayat in the Quran that teaches about the punishment of Allah, the detailed punishment of Allah, that's also a means that keeps, away, keeps us away from sins and evil desires. Read about the detailed punishment of Allah and what happens to people that are in the hellfire. What they eat, what they drink, how they're thrown in Jahannam, how they're chained, how they're tied, how their skin burns, how their face melts when the hot water is brought to it. How their bellies and intestines melt as the hot water and the murky oil goes in. How the intestines come out. How they're smashed with iron clubs on their faces. Keep reading these descriptions because reading the descriptions of Jahannam safeguards a person from sins and evil desires. And there are other matters. These are some things, a few matters that are practical that I hope and I ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He place within them barakah in our lives. We ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that He accept our gathering, that He forgive our sins and our shortcomings. We ask Him Subhanahu wa Taala to safeguard us against sins and desires. We ask Him Subhanahu wa Taala to strengthen our iman. We ask Him Subhanahu wa Taala to cause our death upon La Ilaha Illa Allah. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub, thabbit qulubana ala dinik. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار ربنا اصرف عنا عذاب جهنم إن عذابها كان غراما إنها ساءت مستقرا ومقاما أسك الله عز وجل تأكسب فيما صول والله أعلم وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين